Gentlemen, and welcome to this afternoon's meeting of the Policing Authority with the Garda Commissioner. Just as usual, in advance of the meeting starting, and just take note of all the emergency exits, one at the side of the hall and one through the doors that you entered down at the back. If, you're, if you need any help, there's members of the Policing Authority staff around the room, so just let them know. Um, as usual, the meeting is streamed live and there will be a recording, so just be aware of that. Um, can you all check that your mobile phones are switched off? Um, and silence must be observed at all times. If you need to leave the room, just do so as quietly as possible through the back door and try not to disturb the meeting. Um, and finally, as usual, um, this meeting is an engagement between the authority and the Garda Commissioner and you're present to observe. There'll be no opportunity, therefore, for anyone other than the authority and Garda representatives to pa participate in the meeting. Thank you very much. Josephine. Thank you, Helen. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Commissioner, you're welcome. Um, this afternoon's meeting is an additional special meeting of the Policing Authority with the Guard the Commissioner uh, outside of our normal schedule. It has a single agenda item, namely Guard the performance issues arising in the context of the Guard the Juvenile Diversion Scheme. At the outset, I want to emphasise that programmes which provide a second chance to young people who commit an offence are enormously important in the public interest. The impact on the life of a child who is successfully diverted away from a criminal path is immeasurable, not to, men not to mention the impact on society in terms of possible future crimes not committed. They contribute to a core policing function of crime prevention and they are extremely valuable in securing community support for the police. So in that context, I want to put it at the outset beyond doubt that the Garda Youth Diversion Programme is a very good programme. It has operated in various forms for over 50 years. The authority has no doubt that in that time it has benefited many, many thousands of children and has had notable successes. But the performance issue which we are examining today relates to children who were deemed unsuitable for the programme and for whom there was no follow-up or no consequences. This issue was identified by the Garda Inspectorate in 2014 and by yourselves and the Garda Professional Standards Unit carried out work which concluded in 2017. The authority has been monitoring, Commissioner, your colleagues' work uh, as you try to bottom out the extent of the problem. And so during 2018, we've had it on our agenda regularly, including in public session in April, June and November uh, of last year. For the benefit of the public who may be watching this meeting, I should explain that children who enter the Youth Diversion Programme must accept responsibility for their actions, they must agree to accept a caution from the Gardaí, and they must agree to a certain level of supervision if appropriate. In return, they're not prosecuted. A deal is made. So when there are no consequences for children who are unsuitable for the programme, it is inherently unfair on those who accepted their responsibilities. More seriously than that, however, is that without follow-up, opportunities to help those children who were found unsuitable are missed. The children are failed and the existing and future victims are failed. And from the authority's point of view, this is a grave set of circumstances that we want to talk to you about today. As always, Commissioner, we will not discuss individual cases in public session. Neither will we discuss details of any disciplinary action that may be taken in, in relation to individual members. And we recognise that you will be careful in discussing this matter not to say or imply anything which might prejudice, prejudice future action. And we're very comfortable with that. We have had a number of detailed briefings from you in private session in relation to these matters. We also received a detailed technical letter from you late yesterday about a new issue in relation to referrals, which while the issue may be new and the process is different, has similar outcomes for another large number of children. The authority members have not had an opportunity to analyze that in any detail. And so where, nevertheless, there may be one or two high level questions about it today we will study it in detail and we will discuss it with you uh, on another occasion. So with that, uh, Commissioner, I'd like to invite you 
to, to address us, to set out uh, your take on, on this whole issue for us before we begin uh, to, to ask questions. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon, authority members. Before I outline the detail and the extent of this problem, on behalf of Angarda Shikana, I want to apologize to the more than 3,000 individual and organizational victims that we have let down. They expected us, Angarda Shikana, to pursue the crimes committed against them, to fill to the fullest extent possible our responsibilities in terms of investigation, and in their cases, we did not do this. And I say again, I profoundly apologize for that feeling. Each and every one of these cases should have been investigated. The public expects that if something is reported that it is investigated, I expect the same. We've let society down by not fully pursuing these crimes, some of them serious, committed by young people. I also want to apologize to those young people that we also let down. These were in the main vulnerable children who, had commit, who were suspected of committing crimes, who had committed crimes in the past and would indeed go on to commit further offences. We should have done better by them in terms of the intervention that we failed to carry out. This examination by Angarda Shikana has found that this issue was caused by both organisational and individual failings. We have put active measures in place to significantly reduce the instances of this issue. And by 2017, the um, failings had fallen to 0.7% of all youth referrals. We've put in place further measures in 2018, and only in the last two weeks, we've established for the first time a National Bureau of Child Diversion headed by a Chief Superintendent on a full-time basis. We continue to monitor this area very closely, both at a local and national level, to prevent any reoccurrence, to make sure that our systems are working properly and our systems are properly supervised. The Police and, the Police and Authority and Department of Justice have been kept informed of this examination and the issues arising over the last year. In addition, Garda Shikana has appointed outside consultants to validate, further validate our examination process. They started work on this last week. What is being presented today is an interim report and the final figures may change as a result of further examination. But also then, I have to take into account that there will be an individual examination of each of these cases, in particular where members of Angarda Shikana have been concerned what their actions were, and indeed a consideration of a discipline process that may then follow by the divisional officer. We will keep the police authority and Department of Justice regularly informed on the outcome of these processes, as we will in terms of the uh, outturn of the uh, exam ongoing examination. And we provide assurance that we will provide assurance that the system is working properly and correctly today. I also want to echo your own comments in saying that while this examination has found serious issues and issues that we regard very gravely, it is also um, should not take away from the significant and important work that is being done and is being done by the Garda Youth Diversion Programme in preventing crime, protecting communities and steering thousands of young people away from a life of antisocial behaviour and crime. Almost two-thirds of children receiving an informal or formal caution as their first caution under the diversion programme do not go on to re-offend. And that is a very credible success in part on this programme. If I may then go on to some of the detail that I want to present today. As you've already said, uh, this matter uh, was surfacing in the period 2014 to 2017, both through the work of uh, the Inspectorate, the Ombudsman, and our own Garda Professional Standards Unit. Between July 17 and January 18, it picked up pace uh, with a scoping exercise to further identify the potential scale of the issue. And then, when that reported last year in January 2018, a 
team was appointed dedicated to examine all of the referrals that, this, um, that, that were impacted from the period 25th of July 2010 to July, 20, 20th July 2017. Examination in this work began in January 2018. The issue arose primarily as the introduction, because of the introduction of a new electronic referral system in July of 2010. And as I, as I will outline later, a number of pulse uh, amendments and fixes were put in place in 2015 and 2017 that significantly re, uh, reduced the occurrence of this particular issue. So that in large part, even before the examination team were in place, this, had, this problem had been addressed. Over the seven years that we examined, we looked at 158,521 youth referrals relating to a total of 57,386 children. 103,000 of those referrals were deemed suitable for the diversion programme and were dealt with through that manner. 55,500 referrals were deemed not suitable for the diversion programme and of those, 33,300 referrals resulted in a child being charged or summoned. In particular then, we examined 22,000 cases or referrals where we could not find uh, evidence of an associated charge, summons or outcome on pulse. And of those then, we have identified a group of approximately 7,890, which were not appropriately progressed. So this equates in total to 5% of all, of all the referrals, but a greater proportion of those obviously who were uh, found not to be deemed suitable for the diversion program. We in no way wish to minimize this situation. As I've said in my introductory comments, there's a significant failing on part of the organization, both in terms of the victims, but also the young people themselves in terms of an intervention uh, that, that, that was missed. And the 7,890 referrals that I refer to, that refers to a group of children of um, 3,480 3, children. So I then outline the impact that we've identified on victims. And these are numbers, but we also recognize the profound um, impact that we will have had on these victims um, in not pursuing these crimes and offenses in a manner in which they would have expected. And again, I reiterate my apology on behalf of Angarda Shikana. Of the victims, 2,492 were individual personal victims. 988 business or organizational victims are also identified. In some cases, these victims may have received a letter saying that a person had been identified in respect uh, of an offense and that they had been reported, and this would not have been correct. 73% of the crimes not appropriately progressed were in four uh, main crime type areas, <coughs> public order, theft, traffic, and criminal damage. But within the crime types, there are also serious crimes. There's a crime of rape, there's a crime of a sexual offence, there's a crime of child neglect, but there's also crimes related to aggravated burglary, the cultivation of drugs, violent disorder, and threats to kill. All of these are within this group. I want to outline what we're doing to support the victims. Over the immediate term, I mean over the next seven days, each victim will receive a letter specific to their case. The letter will include an apology from Angarda Shikana for the case not being progressed appropriately, a victim information leaflet and contact details for the local Garda victim service offices and the independent crime victims helpline, which will provide support and more information as required. Victims will also be given the option of receiving a personal uh, visit by their local Garda team. The posting of letters started this morning. Anyone who feels that they may have been affected by this issue, by this issue can contact the Garda Youth Referral uh, Free Phone Helpline, and we'll be placing this on the internet and through um, our social media. And again, we will have an email address, which again we will put on the internet, 
and on our social media. The helpline is open now and will operate from Monday to Sunday, 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. for the next two weeks. A number of the victims of serious crimes will receive a, a personal visit again in the, in the coming days. We recognise very much that this information will come as a surprise and indeed as a shock to victims. The last thing we want to do is to re-victimise or indeed re-traumatise anyone. And we've put in place these measures to help and support victims affected at this time. We also have to consider the impact on the young people that we also failed. There are approximately 3,480 children associated with the referrals not appropriately progressed. The vast majority of these children were in a position where they had a history of offending, they were in chaotic lifestyles, they had contact with Angarda Shikana and other agencies, and this incident in which we detected them was not appropriately progressed. Each of these children will receive a letter by the district officer specific to their case, informing them that their case was not progressed appropriately and details of where more information and support can be provided if required. Those who are now adults will receive their own letter. If they're still under 18, the letter will be issued to their parent or guardian. What we've seen in the examination, our examination of, of uh, this particular um, problem, is that by um, 2017, uh, there is a significant reduction. The problem peaks in 2011 with a failure rate of approximately 7.3%, but falls each year after that with significant reductions after um, changes to the pulse system in 2015 and again in 2017. And we continue to monitor, monitor uh, this very closely and indeed provided details yesterday of our findings in terms of 2018, in which we can talk about again. But we've also taken further action. Our latest pulse release of February 2018 means that youth referrals can only be created with the approval of the local administrator or a district officer. In November 18, a new monitoring system for youth referrals uh, was introduced. In December 18, the National Bureau for Child Diversion was established. A chief superintendent has been appointed to head this bureau on a full-time basis. And staffing in the bureau was increased in 20. 2018 and will be further increased throughout this year. Also then within the organisation we've had an increase in 2018 in the number of supervisors both at the sergeant and inspectors rank and that's very welcome in terms of the local supervision uh, of, these, of these investigations. In January 18, only last week, we've introduced new standing operating procedures and we've also then introduced an e-learning training package for all Garda members on the youth referral progress, uh, pro process. And the youth referral process will be subject to scrutiny and internal audit examination in the forthcoming years to make sure that this problem does not arise again. It is very important to us, but, but more importantly to the public and to the victims and our oversight authorities that there's confidence in the youth referral scheme. And as I've, and as I've pointed out, in 2018 and 2019, a lot of work has gone into this process. We've introduced a series of measures to ensure that such a confidence can be placed again in this scheme, and we want to provide the, the reassurance over the coming months to the policing authority in terms of regular and in-depth detailed briefings of our, finding, of, our own, of our findings in respect of our ongoing work. Today is an interim report, and undoubtedly, as we start to examine the individual cases, some of the, some of the numbers will change. As I said at the outset, the Youth Diversion Programme works very well. It's a major benefit to individuals and to our society. And these further enhancements will strengthen the system and ensure such, such failings cannot happen again. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for those remarks, Commissioner. And clearly there's a lot there for people to take in, but the authority has, uh, has published some figures on its website, which might help people to follow the, the, the narrative. Our questioning is going to begin uh, with Valerie. Okay, Valerie. thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioner and team. I think it might be useful for, for people listening in and um, 
people who are becoming interested in this area to maybe understand a little bit more about how the process works. We'll be going on, I think, this afternoon to talk a little bit about process failures and what you have done about that and what we'll, you will be doing about that. But it might be useful. Now, I, I, I know none of us wants to talk about individual identifiable cases, but if it helps by a way of explanation to give a, a typical scenario, that might be useful. So maybe to kick off, if you could talk us through the process up to the point at which a child is, is, is decided to be suitable or not for the programme. So maybe from the child's perspective and the guard's perspective, in, in plain English, if you like, what, what happens. Okay, well, if I can uh, look to, uh, to Pat to lead off on that, please. Okay, thanks, okay, Pat. Hi, Valerie. Uh, the process has changed, so I'll deal with the period that was within scope, Valerie, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what changes. Thank you. Okay. In, in 2010... The paper-based system, which had been in place since 1963, basically, you know, was automated. So it went onto the Pulse system. And the referral was generated by the date of birth that was put in by the guard. So the guard encounters a young person on the street in an offence situation, goes in, puts the name and address and the date of birth details in on Pulse. As soon as the date of birth uh, hits it, it, goes, it starts the process of creating a referral. What's the upper age that determines a person as a child? Uh, 18 years program. old. Okay. 18 years old. Uh, yes. You have to be under 18 mm -hmm. and uh, uh, 12 or above. Now, that changed in the 2006 Act where you can, between 10 and 12, come into the programme but for very specific offences. Okay. So we'll just deal with, at the moment, between 12 and 18. Mm -hmm. So the, the referral was automatically created. It didn't go through what we call our performance and accountability framework system where the superintendent would have sight of it. So uh, data birth created the first part of the process. As soon as it was reviewed that, uh, um, reviewed that all the detail was right, it transferred into the Garda Youth Diversion Programme. From the child, could you talk me through the experience from the young person's perspective? Well, from the young person's perspective, they were caught doing something. Yeah. They may very well have been arrested and brought in, and the process starts. Mm -hmm. Now, if they're included, now, once it gets into the director of the programme, once the referral arrives, the director of the programme, a superintendent, determines whether or not the child is suitable to go into the diversion programme or whether or not they're going to be sent back to the local district officer deemed unsuitable back for prosecution. Okay. And so, again, it's just so people understand sort of how it happens. Are there parents involved at this stage? Yes, mm -hmm. indeed. In order to be uh, suitable for the programme, the child has to admit to the offence uh, that they were involved <coughs> in. Uh, the public uh, in general need to be considered. The victim needs to be considered. But the main one really is do they actually admit to the offence that they've been involved in? The director then makes a decision based on that and based on previous offending whether or not the child is suitable for inclusion. If the, uh, the child and the majority are uh, deemed suitable for inclusion, then the likes of the jail or the juvenile liaison officer out in the district or division where the child lives is brought into the programme and either a caution, a, a formal or an informal caution or a restorative uh, approach to dealing with it starts. There is also a facility there where you can sit down and have a meeting with other stakeholders around this. Uh, so there's, there's several stages that can be involved, but generally speaking, the vast majority okay. are either an informal or a formal caution. Sorry to interrupt you, uh, yep. uh, it's just in, in the interest of time, but also in the interest of people who aren't maybe familiar with the programme. Is the victim aware of this process at this point? Yes. Okay. And you, you mentioned restorative justice. Do you want to explain briefly what that means? Yes, it really is about sitting down with the victim and the offender and dealing with it in a way where you bring them together. Mm -hmm. And it, obviously, look, the victim has to agree to this and the director has to determine that the, the victim and the offender coming together is not going to result in okay. a, you know, a less okay. than appropriate interaction. But they come together, they discuss the incident, and it really is about uh, bringing home to the child the nature of the impact that that, uh, um, I suppose, action has had on the victim themselves and trying to uh, get a bit of understanding and balance between the two. Okay. And really, it ends up, you have no um, prosecution, uh, the offender walks away with a better understanding of the impact they're having on uh, individuals and the community <coughs> as a whole, and the victim gets an opportunity to see who okay. and what the child is and what may have contributed so, so to the So moving on behavior. then, and i come back to when a child is suitable. If a child is not suitable for a programme, why would a child not be suitable for a programme? It could generally? be uh, the history of offending. It could be that the child uh, doesn't admit to the offence. It could be that... The child's parents won't engage with it, and obviously then there's no uh, um, uh, admission of, of offending. Mm -hmm. And on those cases, it might be in the public interest 
that it's not an appropriate case to be dealt with uh, within the programme, and that happens uh, as well. And then it's returned back. What would be an example of nothing in the public interest? There could be very uh, serious or um, the nature sensitive of the, cases. Nature of the incident. Yeah, that okay. just would not be appropriate uh, within what the programme. What kind of proportion of children would not be considered suitable? Uh, about two-thirds of them go through and are um, deemed suitable every year, so about a third. And what happens don't. that third then? The actual case and the information that the uh, director has is sent back to the local district officer, the superintendent, and the superintendent then is uh, directed prosecution back over to you. You need to deal with this now in the normal criminal justice system. They were unsuitable for a diversion programme. And how is that communicated to the child? That's communicated out on the ground, uh, generally speaking, by the JLO or the actual investigating member that okay. first encountered the child may very well go out and issue a charge sheet or issue uh, a summons, depending so, on okay. uh, the gravity of so the So back offense. then, too, when a child is suitable for the programme, what happens at that point? And are other agencies, actually in both cases, are other agencies involved uh, since some of these would, could be vulnerable yes. children? Yes. Yeah. The JLO, who's our juvenile liaison officer, who's either a guard or a sergeant in the district or division where the actual offender resides, uh, will engage with the child. They'll engage with the child's parents. If mm -hmm. they determine that there is a, a meeting or a conference required, other agencies can uh, attend that conference based and they'll be invited in. So there are support services around the child. These are for people that are in the programme. Outside of the programme, generally speaking, it is the criminal justice system that is brought to bear and the child ends up going to the uh, children's court. Now, and if it's a child you've come across, for the, the first time you've come across this child, would you, as a matter of normal process, contact TUSLA and... and yeah, it depends on the situation, the, and generally industry. speaking, mm. there'll be a referral made to TUSLA. Okay, okay. So, um, and just before I pass on to my colleagues, would it be possible, can you paint a picture of the cohort of children considered not suitable for the programme? Um, back to that point, is there an age profile, type and frequency of offending, socioeconomic background? Is, 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 there, a, is there a typical sort of cohort... And, and how similar or different would it be to the ones who are considered suitable? You have the full continuum of yeah. children, but is it weighted in, 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 in one area? You could say yes. Are there trends is. in terms of children who are considered not suitable for the programme? Uh, yes, there are. We can identify certain trends there. And what, what would those trends Generally like? speaking, there is um, a trajectory beforehand in terms of the type and the volume of crime that's been, uh, been committed by the child. Uh, Lots of social circumstances come into it in terms <coughs> of, uh, I suppose, the background and um, their situation. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, there are certain trends that we can see in certain groupings that we can see. And obviously there's an element of judgment in this, and, and that's appropriate. Absolutely. Are you satisfied that in this, if you like, triaging, that, that it's culturally appropriate in terms of profiling of any kind? Well, that's a huge question, Valerie, and I suppose it's something that needs to be explored. I mean, look, in terms of, um, I suppose, referring them to, back to the criminal justice system at all, I mean, they're a, huge, they're, they're a significantly vulnerable group. This, this cohort yeah. that are deemed unsuitable, there's a vulnerability uh, associated with that group as well. And I suppose what we have currently is we refer them back to the criminal justice system. Yeah. And coming out of this examination, certainly we're highlighting that aspect of it and saying, look, you know, this may not be the appropriate ending for these ch uh, children, that we may not need to look at something that is far more uh, engaging with okay. them. There's something that's similar to a YJARC scenario, where we have all the agencies to get in and do a wraparound service with them. But look, that really is a, a, a large area uh, to get in and explore. But certainly, in we've the examination you're doing, um, we're obviously going to, going to come to some of the flaws in the process and some with very serious consequences. But are you, uh, in, in the examination, are you considering the kind of rich information you're getting which might steer you in terms of your strategy Absolutely. in this area Absolutely. going forward? Okay. Um, final question, maybe back to the Commissioner. Apart from the problems, very serious problems we're going to be looking at, do you regard the Youth Diversion Programme as successful and why? Well, uh, yes, I am. Even um, if we look at the period under examination, 96% uh, of these cases were successfully uh, dealt with but you have to look at the 103,000 referrals, which were properly dealt with as well, in terms of uh, the entering into the process and being diverted away from the courts, and, and the success rate that we have in terms of that. Yeah, and, the and subsequent, like the outcomes for those children who go into this programme, 
is there a significant difference in terms of recidivism and, and other outcomes in their futures? Uh, that you've measured. Yes, there is in, in yeah. terms of success. And those who aren't accepted in the program, uh, as, as Pat's already set out, it, in part it's because of their previous offend behaviour mm. and, and they've actually, the program has not been suitable for them. You know, mm. they've not responded to that and indeed they've continued to, to re-offend. So okay. uh, in some ways through their behaviours, they're selected out of that. Uh, the, the program is designed to help young people to help children and to take them away from you know, cycles of offending and antisocial behaviour. And, and there is a lot of pride in the organisation in, in, in the success that it's had. And indeed, I'm told internationally, it is well respected as well. But I think um, over the next while, as we have, um, as you say, richer information about this, I think we'll be able to provide more empirical evidence about its success. And, and as I say, this is an interim report. We want, we want to show the value of this system too and why we're putting additional effort in terms in, in respect of it and the additional resources to it because it, it, it is a public good, the okay. difference that this is making. Well, I think that's a particularly important point to remember because we are talking about issues that have arisen, but it's particularly important that this is a positive programme yeah. and you want to progress it for the future. Okay, yeah. thank you, Chair. Thanks, thanks, Valerie. Um, I guess as Valerie has said, we now have to turn to talk about uh, the failures and we're going to begin with some questions from Moling. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, and um, thank you, Commissioner, for your opening remarks um, addressing a number of the issues that have arisen, have arisen here and certainly I acknowledge the point that you make uh, in terms of the cases um, that weren't appropriately progressed as a consequence of guard inaction, equating to 5% of all referrals but you could also identify it as equating to between 14 and 15 percent of cases that of those cases deemed not suitable for the diversion yes. program. Yes. So, so there, there are a significant number of cases involved. I would also maybe say at the outset, um, certainly my own perspective and that of that the authority, we do have concerns in relation to the pace at which um, this, this particular examination uh, took place. Um, I would have mentioned earlier that um, uh, the issue was first identified <laughs> in the inspectorate report back in 2014 and um, uh, and really it was 2017 before actions were taken as a consequence of the profession, serv um, uh, the profession, profession service u uh, unit mm -hmm. uh, taking up, um, taking up um, uh, the detailed report and presenting it. And I acknowledge at the same time the amount of work that's been done over the last year, um, led by Assistant Commissioner Lee on that, but I think it's important that I, that I state um, my concern in relation to the pace and the consequences of that um, from all perspectives, from you as, as the Guardian, from us as a, an oversight authority and indeed from the various parties that you're now interacting with as a consequence of this. So I just, just mentioned that without, without expecting, expecting a response. My area of questioning is looking very much at um, what occurred, why it occurred, how it occurred. Um, my colleagues will be taking up the issue of the impact victims and various associated, associated issues. But if I might maybe, maybe at the outset um, just, just um, address a couple of questions not specifically directed towards the, um, the, the number of cases that, um, that weren't progressed as a consequence of guarded in action, but just, just a couple of general points. There were something like 5,000 referrals that weren't progressed due to the absence of sufficient evidence. And I know that's a natural course of uh, uh, a natural issue or very, a, a regular issue in the context of um, guard investigation. Um, I'd just like to put a question to you whether um, any of those cases were due uh, also to the failure of the investigating guard to gather the necessary evidence or if you have anything to offer on that. Uh, well, if, if there's any uh, suggestion of a, of a of a failing on the part of Angarda Shikana, then it belongs in the group uh, 7924 referrals, which we, we feel have not been dealt with appropriately. That group of 5,000 odd, um, that is genuinely where there's not sufficient evidence to sustain a prosecution. And so referrals made in good faith, it comes back to the individual member, they examine that, submit a report, and there's insufficient evidence then uh, to um, mount, mount a prosecution. Any other suggestion? It goes into that uh, th that group of of an inadequate response, and in just saying about that group, having looked at in detail at some of the cases within that, 
the, the, um, our body, our, our individuals, our, our staff who were looking at this have taken a very wide definition of what, is an, uh, what would be regarded as an inadequate response. And I think that over time, as we start to further, further examine each of those cases, the numbers may, ch uh, may change again. So um, we, we have taken a very strict interpretation uh, around this categorization. And before we'd have labeled something as insufficient evidence, the body of evidence, the file will have been examined and that will have been um, assessed as properly the right disposal for this, that particular one. Thank you for that. Another, another um, question in relation to the, those, those broad number, um, numbers of uh, cases. Um, one, one, of the, one, of, one of the statistics that emanated from the material that you supplied to us was that there was a time delay concerning nearly 400 referrals, which was not the result of investigating guard in action. Who was responsible for that? Well, that, that can just be a matter of uh, gathering evidence uh, from other areas and just delays in, in doing that, which then led to um, this, uh, cases being statute barred. So it may have been the obtaining of, of uh, uh, say, ma medical evidence or other forensic evidence and, and created a delay, particularly in a case which um, is a summary case and, and subsequently is statute barred. Any of those issues, um, or, or that as an issue generally, has it caused you some concern? Does it appear a high figure? Would it appear to be... Um, all, all easily, easily explained? Well, again, uh, if we don't have a, you know, what we regard as a satisfy, satisfactory explanation, then it, it would move out of that category and it moves, out of the, in, it moves into the category where we feel it was an inappropriate response by Angarda Shikana. So of that group, we are content that um, you know, the rationale is set out and we can stand over that documentation. And, and indeed, that's why we have this uh, ind independent external uh, audit ongoing to, to further examine, in effect, our, our workings so that we can be entirely stand over these figures. Thank you for that. One of, one of the items that caused me concern was um, that there were a number of cases that weren't prosecuted in spite of there being a DPP direction. Yes. How, how or why did this happen? So that relates um, 26 referrals and that then leads to um, 10 individuals. Uh, in some of those cases, and again, a very strict interpretation, so um, perhaps in, in one case in particular, the DPP is directed on two charges and only one charge then um, is uh, uh, dealt with through the court. The other, the other charge is not dealt with. But that's what happens sometimes when, when uh, the courts consider matters, other issues drop off. Uh, we've um, one pretty constant recidivist who moves between jurisdictions and who over a period of time uh, did evade us and, and evaded uh, prosecution. But all of those cases, and uh, we have been in consultation with the Director of Public Prosecutions uh, in respect of those and others where there was directions to see uh, if we are still able to resurrect um, prosecutions. And again, we will report the outturn out of those negotiations over the, the coming months to the policing authority. Yeah, I want to, I want to move on to the, uh, to the 8,000 cases um, that were in progress as a consequence of, of Garda inaction. Mm -hmm. And just maybe, maybe a general, your, your sense of um, the extent to which this arose as a consequence of failure by individual Garda members purely to carry out their duty. Um, I may say there's, a, there's an element, element here of organisational responsibility. But at the same time, there is an element of, of individual accountability. Um, I have asked that uh, Chief Superintendent, the, the uh, divisional officers, look at all of these cases um, and examine those to see, um, to consider is there a discipline issue, and if there is a discipline issue, to consider that and to consider then what the appropriate disposal might be. Uh, and this is a very considerable undertaking by Angarda Shikana. It involves uh, in, in terms of our staff, uh, 3,400 members. And so it's, a, um, it's an extraordinary undertaking by Angarda Shikana, but I think it is the only response to what I regard as such a serious feeling, um, both in terms of the victims who reported crime, but also in respect of the young people who were in this program. One of the concerns, Commissioner, of course, you, you mentioned the figure, um 3,400 Gardaí, that amounts to about 20, 25% of the force. Yes. Close to it. 
a normal reaction to that would say that this is a systemic issue, that this is, um, that the particular inaction in this situation was something that was not just tolerated um, to a, a considerable extent, but that had, had become part of the practice or non-practice to uh, considerable extent right across the entire force. Firstly, if you might offer a comment on that, and secondly, if you might offer some comment in relation to in relation to whether there were particular areas that were more, most notable in there, without identifying them, that were, that were more notable than others in terms of where this may have occurred? Um, well, in response, I would say that we had 33,000 referrals where, where there was a successful um, prosecution. And indeed, um, where you look to the 22,000 where there was, uh, wasn't a prosecution, we were unsure of the disposal, some 16,000 out of those are properly dealt with. So. Uh, our members do know how to prosecute individuals and these were a requirement to prosecute, to, to prepare a file and submit it then for appropriate consideration. So there's an individual responsibility, but there's also then a corporate responsibility or an organisational responsibility in terms of the introduction of this, um, uh, of, of this uh, um, new system. Sorry, the second part of your question? Uh, the second part was whether there were sort of notable divisions, notable yes. guard stations where, where the numbers the, may have peaked or may have, may have been significantly well, uh, more than others. Well, I think um, what you do see is um, those divisions which are very busy, high workload divisions, are where you do see a concentration. But, um, and you haven't invited me to, but I'm not going to name those actual divisions, those the chief superintendents there and need to be able to work through their processes in respect of examining, examining each case. No, I didn't, I didn't want, I didn't want yeah. those identified. I just, just wanted you to, uh, an observation on whether, whether or not they were particular patterns or evidence of certain areas um, more evident than, than others. Um, I want to have a look, um, if, if, I might, if I might, for, um, for, for just a moment in relation to what I see as a significant issue, um, notably around, around um, um, a follow-up from my earlier question, that's the whole issue of governance and how this could possibly happen um, with um, the processes that are procedures that were in place. So correct me if I'm wrong in terms, in terms of the governance uh, process. You've got the, um, the juvenile liaison officer reporting to a sergeant. Reporting into, reporting into the Garda Youth Diversion Office. Correct. There may well yeah. be, be ranks in between. Um, overseen, overseen at the top end of the organisation, and you've also got a statutory monitoring committee. Is that reasonably accurate? The, that, that, that's correct. And I think the distinction I would make, and I'm sorry, Pat, will come in with more detail, has, is in respect of the referrals, 103,000 referrals, which were those accepted into the programme, those specifically then became the responsibility of the juvenile liaison programme, the juvenile liaison officers, and there was, in effect, a feedback and supervision loop in respect of that. Mm. It was those that were not accepted into right. the programme, then moved back out to into the divisions, the, and, yeah. and that's then yeah. where the breakdown yeah. is, yeah. Uh, in some cases, in the governance. Yeah, the, the distinction, and I appreciate, I appreciate, I appreciate that. I'm, well, let's, let's take it then in the, context, in the context of the hierarchy of supervision. Do you find it particularly difficult to comprehend how such a large number of cases such as this, where there was a failure to take appropriate action, managed, managed to make its way over a significant period of time without an intervention at the various hierarchical levels, without an input at the senior well, th there would have been some element within the diversion office of knowing what was going on, but in terms of the senior management, senior management itself, and indeed, in turn, um, the um, monitoring committee being alerted. It, it seems, it seems, fourteen and a half percent of the cases that uh, that that uh, that that weren't being pursued, and yet all that hierarchy seem seems to have been unaware of what was happening on a fairly significant scale. Well, might I say that? When we start to examine these cases individually, and I've quoted a figure of 3,400 members, I also have to take into account then the quality of the supervision that they received or did not receive in, in these cases, and whether then there's a further consideration in respect of that. That in some way inhibits me from expressing a view 
in respect of what the supervision was. And I regret that, um, that I can't express that view, but I feel I shouldn't because there's a due process issue here, I fear, in respect of how we deal with this going forward and, and the discipline that might be considered in respect of those individuals who had a supervisory responsibility. I, I, you know, I can't, I can't just, I, you know, I can't say this is about 3,400 Garda, Garda alone. There's a, there was a supervisory, there was a supervision process there as well. And that, I mean, that's, that's, that's exactly, exactly where, where I was heading to, um, was where we talk about 3,400 Garda um, having been remiss in following, following the appropriate uh, process uh, to, address, to address this and the consequence. So there, there is a hierarchy above which, which either, either just ignored, didn't address, um, allowed, it, allowed it to proceed. There was no structures right up the organisation to, to address what, what now transpires to be a very significant uh, issue of, of failure to act in, in, in issues that had, had uh, significant consequences. And... Um as the ultimate discipline authority, though I've delegated this to the, um, <coughs> the chief superintendent, uh, I'm inhibited in expressing my view on this in, in its entirety, certainly in, a, in this public forum. But what we will undertake to do uh, is we will um, monitor the examinations. Um, we will see then if discipline is a consideration and then what the outturn of that is and uh, we will then brief the, the policing authority as we move along. Well, can I... Somewhat related sense, um, uh, and this is um, this is the guard inaction and the form that that inaction inaction took, and you su supplied some figures, pretty significant number, um, for example, that um, there uh, uh, quite a number, maybe over 350 cases that weren't progressed uh, due to a guard being transferred or annual leave or career break. Well, um, th these are a result of our. Uh, initial queries as to what has happened. So, in examining the 22,000 odd cases, uh, you know, we, we were we were able to prove or um, obtain uh, in many of those 16,000 odd um, an explanation, a narrative of what happened, and not explain those. But in those other um, 7,800 odd, we did provide what we are reporting there is what was reported back to us. What we've engaged on now is a different process where. With an individual examination, uh, with uh, a view, perhaps to the consideration of discipline. So we will have better feedback on exactly what happens, I, uh, what's point, happened going forward. Point, point taken, but I, I, I feel obliged to, to raise to raise a couple of issues. Um, first, firstly, where in, in a significant number of cases where the report back to you um, was was that um, the individual member reported not receiving any correspondence at all. Any observation on that as a reason for inaction? Um, you are pressing me on matters which may relate, mm -hmm. and I have to pick my words very carefully, may relate yeah. um, to the consideration of discipline. I'm, I'm, I'm raising, I, I raise it in the context, Commissioner, of, um, uh, of, of where to my mind, um, there are serious concerns in relation to the willingness of individual members of the Gardaí to respond to requests or demands for information from Garda headquarters or from senior members of the force. And I raise it, I raise it in the context of where um, there's been an identification that uh, in quite a considerable number of cases correspond there were requests for information there were a significant number of reminders and mm -hmm. presumably associated with that there's all that hierarchy, yep. hier hierarchy as well that to me suggests a significant malaise in relation to the operation management functioning of of maybe not just individual areas but provisions beyond that um and in, and in making that observation, um, might I suggest that I should be judged by the decisions I've made and the actions that I propose to take mm -hmm. in terms of an examination of this, not just from a learning point of view, but also is there discipline wi within this? Yeah. Um, because um, I, I, my, my concern is, my concern obviously, if that's the approach to a request and demand for information in this particular case, the extent to which it also is also referable to the entire operation 
um, and I'm certainly the authority would have serious concerns in terms in terms of his oversight responsibility if that's action. Well, really if um, uh, if I may reiterate the the point I made earlier, that it is an extraordinary step for me to engage in effect um, on a process which is going to examine the behaviour of. 3,400 Gardaí and then perhaps their supervisors in terms of a consideration is their discipline. So many of the points that you're making to me are points that I have considered over the last couple of months. Um, part, of the, um, part of the governance structure framework that I spoke to earlier is the statutory monitoring committee of which um, yes. Assistant Commissioner Leahy is, is, is chair and has been chair for the last well, 18 months or whatever, uh, in, in relation to, and it would have it would have um, it would have been expected by the authority um, that, um, having been alerted from 2014 that there were issues relating to the diversion program, that the committee would have taken a far more intensive scrutiny approach to the operation of that program, and that. That is not evident, certainly in the two reports and that I have looked at, which is 2016-2017 reports. There's a both, in, in both situations, there's a reference to it, but there's no indication as to the seriousness with which you took it, and which the committee took, and any suggestion that it had a significance in terms of its operation or that, you know, that, that particular actions had to be taken as a consequence of that. I, I can only talk, obviously, uh, about my personal um, input into it, uh, which came about in 2017 after I actually started the examination. So I was appointed after I took up this uh, examination, or put the team on this examination. Um, so look, we were we were uncovering through 2017 the detail that is that we now have, but coming in from 2014, 2015, 2016, it does appear in those. Now I, I hadn't uh, input in that I wasn't. Uh, um, part of the, of the monitoring committee at that time, but I'm going back over it, I can see where they were raising it because it was in the public domain from other agencies, had identified some of the issues that we're dealing with now, and the monitoring committee had raised them in the monitoring committee report, and then coming into 2017, when I took up in the second half of 2017, I was already examining it with a serious examination team, so we were beginning to uncover the real, uh, I suppose, numbers that were... Um, that we're now discussing. So at that stage, that was only ever going to be available in the 2018 report, because we now know, and we wouldn't have known in 2017, the detail that we know now for sure. But in, in fairness to the people that came before me, it was raised, it was out there in the public domain, they were uh, making reference to the reports that had already come out uh, since 2014, saying this is an issue, this is an issue. There were, um, the Commissioner in his opening statement made reference to the um, adjustments to Pulse which gives um, significant information on an ongoing basis allowing for greater oversight, greater monitoring, greater review in terms of what's happening even as you quite rightly say on a day-to-day -day basis. But there were processes in place which would have allowed the interrogation of statistics um, for quite a number of years ahead of that. Was there no such analysis being undertaken? Was there no process of monitoring? Where should it have taken place? Well, I, I believe my, under, my understanding is that the initial um, July 2010 um, digitization of this didn't provide a feedback loop for, in effect, this um, 55,000. So, um, so between 2010 and 2015, the feedback loop that the... Um, the Garda Youth Diversion Office should have had and the information that they should have had was not, um, was not automatic. And then obviously throughout that period, suspicions started to arise around what was happening to these cases which were outside then the view of the Youth Diversion Office and then that was subsequently reported on in, in 14 by the Inspectorate and 16 by the Ombudsman and by our own. Um, professional uh, professional standards examination as well. Now, I think that's my understanding. If there be anything further on that, Pat. yeah, I mean the the perception of the GYDO was once they were deemed unsuitable for the program, mm -hmm. it was back out to the 28 uh, divisions, mm -hmm. and indeed they didn't even go in at divisional level. They went in at district level to the district officers, and as far as they were concerned, which they didn't have sight of it anyway, mm -hmm. and all. But their part of the uh, process was done. 
and also from that perspective there was uh, no monitoring of the UTCOs and what happened after it. When I say UTCO, unsuitable to this case only. Okay, um, thank you um, very much. I'm just just um, coming coming close to the end of my my time, but uh, you might uh, certainly the authority would be interested in its oversight capacity of your observations, um, Commissioner, at this stage, and why this happened. Um, I think part uh, well, there's two elements I've already laid out. I think the organisational failing it was in July 10 about bringing in a system. Um, without sufficient actual governance of that system. Um, and every system that you introduce an IT system, you regularly have to review its operation, the unintended consequences, and constantly then you have to be looking for what, what, did, we not, what, what did we not see, which happens, the unforeseen consequences, and finding then the patches to fix that. And that didn't happen then for a number of years. Um, Pulse 6.8 uh, does resolve this issue to a very considerable extent, 7.3 further bolsters that. And so you can see those improvements. But I, as I've said earlier, I don't diminish then that individual guards and their supervisors did know how to report individuals for prosecution. And when these matters were referred to the districts, that's what was re required of them. And that didn't happen then. Um, of, from our initial examination of this in, in almost 8,000 cases. Thank you, Marlon. Uh, just before I pass over to Judith, one quick question for me. And I just want to clarify the role of this monitoring committee. Um, it's a statutory body. Yes. And it's supposed to monitor the effectiveness of the programme. And I, I, we were all struck, as Moling has mentioned, in our um, discussions on this in the authority, you know, in the, in the second half of last year, by, and in fact, we raised the annual report question with you, I think, at the November meeting. Um, is there any reason why in the November annual report it shows only three members when they're supposed to be four? Is that just a lapse of time issue? Or the, uh, the 2016 report has a full complement of members on the monitoring committee. The subsequent one has only three members. I guess what we're, what we're at, I think what Moling is searching for, and. The reason I'm asking it is, it seemed to us that in the Children's Act, this was an important oversight piece, an important reassurance, and we're wondering, was it the dog that didn't bark, or, or what happened? It wouldn't be my um, understanding of it, and I'm looking backwards now, because I, I suppose I was in the lucky position that when I was appointed, to it, I already knew because I had already established the examination team. We were getting stuck in it. We knew what happened, and I'm looking backwards at the mm. previous reports, mm. and I can see where they were raising the issues. Uh, so then they were raising them with whom? With the commissioner? Well, uh, do you know? Well, it's, the, the, it's that gap, that that gap before you started yeah. work in a really serious way, which we have acknowledged early last year. Well, the report is developed, and it is developed and sent to the commissioner, and then is subsequently sent on to the uh, department. That is the actual line of reporting uh, in it. In 2017, 2016, 2017, there was a delay in the appointment. My appointment was delayed um, because uh, I, I'm responsible for the Dublin metropolitan region, and this is an additional uh, function and has been before me. And then there was a, a promotion within the programme, so we had a disconnect there as well. Okay, so that, so that's it might just have been a time... Uh, uh, it was a lapse. timing thing. That's all it was. And well, th well and I think, sorry, sorry. We, maybe we actually need to examine this time frame, perhaps from, you know, there, there's correspondence and email correspondence in the organisation, certainly uh, in 2014. And maybe we just need a timeline of mm. 2014 onwards to um, Pat's appointment and the appointment then of the examination team so you can have a full understanding of who was where and when and, and what was being said about this because uh, I think the examination team, um, well, the examination team has retrieved all of that material. Okay. So we can draw that up into a document which can provide a detailed timeline of all of this. Thank you. And then on the same point, you mentioned in your opening remarks, Commissioner, or perhaps in one of your answers, that there, there was going to be a regular audit in future. Was this reported to the Audit Committee, this issue? 
Uh, yes, this issue has been reported to the Audit Committee, and uh, Pat will give a presentation. Thank you. Judith? Thanks, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioner. And uh, I just wanted to follow up on a couple of um, Moling's questions before I go into the area of victims. So um, the, the authority has been concerned for some time around the issues of data quality, and uh, in particular around the area of detections. And I just wanted to ask you this very straightforward question. Of those 7,894 cases that weren't followed up, have they been counted on your system as detections? Uh, yes, Judith, for the most part yeah. they were. Yeah. And the reason they were was since 2010, since it was automated, the uh, child was put on as a suspected offender, which automatically generated a letter out yeah. to the victim to say that the, somebody had been made, been made amenable for their case, yeah. which clearly isn't the case. So we've identified that, and we're going to have to make contact with all yeah. of those people okay. to and uh, deal with that issue. And then we'll have to go in and clean the system. Okay. And all of that so that being the case, has there been any engagement with the CSO um, and will you be there, engaging there, yes, with them the, in the future? There has been engagement with the CSO and they are aware of this uh, emerging issue and um, the deputy and I had a meeting with them in November um, and uh, we explained this situation to them and indeed now we'll provide them um, with the updated report. Okay, and another issue which um, given that we're talking about very vulnerable uh, children in the offending cohort that we're referring to this afternoon with probably very complex needs. Um, is there any quality assurance process for those cases where the child has actually admitted the offence and the case has been referred for inclusion in the youth diversion scheme? Um, I, I'm just thinking about you know, children with learning difficulties, children with, as I say, complex needs from very uh, challenging backgrounds. Um, the, t the temptation might be sometimes to admit to something that you may not have done. Um, so I'm just asking, is there a QA process, is there any dip sampling to reassure yourself that you can be entirely confident that even cases where children have admitted the offence are entirely appropriate to be dealt with in the scheme? No, uh, Judith, that hasn't been, we're talking about people that have been admitted to the programme doing an assessment of those children. Yes. No, the examination team wouldn't have gone into that space at all, Judith. We were really looking for where we had, uh, I suppose, dropped the ball on this. You know. But I'm speaking more generally. Is there any sort of QA process regarding those children and, and, as I say, in many cases, vulnerable children who are included in the scheme? Is there any QA of that? Generally speaking, that would be uh, done by the JLO on the ground who's going to engage personally with the child and with the family. You know, and there are options there for that. Equally, the yeah. director of the programme can apply some uh, of that uh, approach to it, but generally speaking, it's the JLO on the ground who knows the person and the family intimately that's in a position to do that. Okay. It's just my observation comes from the fact that in many cases where the case was deemed unsuitable for inclusion in the scheme, it turns out that there wasn't sufficient evidence to proceed. Do you understand what I'm saying? Oh yes, so you mean then in the 103,000 yeah. referrals there yeah. could have been a substantial proportion of those where we would have had insufficient evidence. Yes. But, um, it's just uh, something that you might wish to reflect on. Um, so um, if we go into now more um, uh, deeply into the area of victims, when I think about the word victim in, the, in this context, I'm thinking about uh, the victims of crime that we know about uh, where crimes were reported to yourselves. Um, there's the second group of victims of arguably preventable offences um, because the scheme wasn't working properly. There's the third category of child offenders as victims who have been failed by the system. And then a fourth category of potential future victims. So if, if we think about the first category, which are the victims of crime that we know about, you referred in your presentation, uh, which was very helpful, thank you, but you referred in it for the to the 73% of cases which weren't followed up that included um, crimes such as theft, traffic offences, criminal damage and public order, what you might categorise as volume offences and that's not to minimise the impact on the victims of those crimes because of course yeah. the Im impact can be devastating in those crimes too. Um, but we also know from your reports that the Youth Diversion Scheme covers some very serious crimes including homicide, rape, kidnapping, child pornography, robbery, hijacking, firearms, 
and aggravated burglary. So without going into the individual cases, could you give us some flavour of the 27% of um, crimes that you haven't included in your list um, and, and what sort of offences we're talking about in, in that cadre? Well, I think um, this, this scheme does cover, and particularly those who weren't accepted into the Youth Diversion Scheme, you're going to see the full range um, of offending. Um, there was offences there of threats to kill, and they, follow, they fall into the homicide um, group. Um, there were offences of um, aggravated burglary, uh, there was, uh, seven of those. There were offences around the cultivation of drugs, and uh, that was um, young people growing uh, cannabis plants. There were some offences in respect of, of uh, violent um, disorder, and also then uh, the possession of drugs. Um, and so some, some of these young people uh, were leading chaotic lives, were engaged in, in uh, multiple offending, and so we see the full uh, range of offences that, f that fall in with this, uh, within this 7,900 odd um, referrals, and, and that's, that's, a, that's a fact of this. What we want to do um, is understand what went wrong and make sure that doesn't happen again. I think we're well on the way in respect of that. But we also then have to reach out to the particular victims, and there are victims here, particularly around things like the threats to kill, uh, aggravated burglary, and give our explanation and give them support um, in, in terms of what went wrong and how we can support them over the next period of time. And so you mentioned in your opening remarks about your strategy for dealing with the victims. Yes. If, if there is a victim of crime out there who thinks they may have been uh, affected by these issues, what should they do? What's your advice? Well, um, those who have been impacted, we will be making communications with them over the next seven days. And that the majority, the vast majority, will receive a letter, uh, and that will then point them then towards their local guard of victim service or the independent crime victims helpline. But we're also prepared as well um, for um, personal visits by a local guard team as well, who've been briefed. Um, and will be briefed on this specific case. If people are worried that they're within this, they can. There's a helpline for them to ring, and that, and that helpline will be staffed and will be able to assure people either, yes, you're one of the victims, or no, your case was properly dealt with and, and you're not included in this group. So in, in the list uh, where you categorise certain cases that, that um, weren't included in the scheme and, and didn't progress to prosecution, etc., you refer to a group of cases, I think it's 2,659, that couldn't be progressed due to circumstances pertaining to the injured party. Uh, and one of those circumstances was that the victim uh, failed to cooperate. Uh, now, that seems quite a significant number of cases where the victim failed to cooperate. Are there any patterns that you're aware of as to why victims might not cooperate with a, a Garda investigation? Is there any comment you might want to make on that? Um, well, the, 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 examin the examination of these overall cases has, you know, thrown up, and each of them, each of them is different. Each of them is a, um, a, a, a unique event in itself, uh, and, a, and the ones that I've seen, particularly in around the serious crime, you find that um, there's an element of, of either um, contact, knew each other, acquaintance, or familial contact and people then, complainants make a complaint and then that's subsequently then uh, withdrawn. And that is, a, that is an element that you see particularly around um, the serious offences and I've, you know, I've looked at the case studies and that does seem to be an element of that. Uh, but that feels anecdotal when you, when you look at the overall number of referrals. So it's something that we can further examine in terms of that 2,600 and see if we can see a pattern in that because that pattern then may play out into other prosecutions and other cases that we, invest, that we wish to investigate. So if um, we think about the outcomes of those referrals for the serious crimes that you've referred to, um, yeah. you know, the most serious crimes in, in that category of the 27%, um, can you give us any sense of the outcomes, what actually happened in those individual without going into individual cases, an, over, an overview of, of the outcomes of those cases. 
did, did the young person go on to reoffend? Did um, their offen offending become worse? Um, that sort of sense. Well, um, of, of, the, of the, the children who um, are in this group of you know, almost, almost 8,000, um, about 10% actually never reoffend or they're not detected again for other, any further offend. So the, the other 90% do go on to um, reoffend. And some of them are on, there's variant trajectories in terms of, of their offending behavior. Uh, there's an average, and I'm, I, and I'm reluctant to give the average because they're individual cases, but the average indicates that some of, the, some of these individuals continue on and commit multiple offenses, but some don't, and others then must only commit one or two offenses then as well. But there are serious offenses committed subsequent to this failure. There's no doubt about that. And there, are, there is also a significant cohort of young people who have offended, who have offended once and not again. Um, and, and you could argue that that evidence is the success of the scheme, that you know, they're, they're referred and, and they don't offend again. Yes. And in fact, that's in the vast majority of cases, which, which is good to see. Uh, I suppose one of my concerns has been around the potential for future victims and to what extent you can be confident that if one of these children who has offended then in adulthood applies for a job involving contact with vulnerable adults or vulnerable children, that those conducting the vetting process will have access to relevant information. Can you be 100% confident, given what we know about these cases, that among these offenders who weren't prosecuted, there isn't someone working in a, a job that involves contact with vulnerable people or, or indeed vulnerable assets, where this information would have been pertinent to their vetting? Um, well, this would have been against their record on Pulse. It's from uh, looking, you know, it's the examination of Pulse which has thrown up these cases and that Pulse record, even though incomplete, would have been available to our vetting section um, when considering any vetting whatsoever and would have raised a query as to what happened here and what was the strength of this. Um, so people have, a, uh, if, if they've applied for such a role, they go through the normal vetting process and our, we would have had a record on Pulse to examine. That, that's my understanding of that, but Are you I, 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 want to be in, well, I want to be entirely sure of it because you've asked me I'm 100% confident and I want to be 100% confident on it, so I'll need to take that question away. Okay, and you'll come back to us? Yes, oh no, absolutely. Um, so the pulse fix that you've referred to, in fact, the, the two pulse fixes, 6, yeah. 8 and 7, 3, um, as I understand it, they came out of other things, um, other data quality concerns, not just the youth diversion issue. So are you completely confident that those technical fixes have dealt with the youth diversion issue going forward? Um, uh, no, because it's only a system. The, the system requires careful supervision and it requires people to take an interest in the work and supervise it and ensure then that the feedback loops are complete. Um, the system will fail without people actually working at it and examining each of these cases. If you look at the volume of what we deal with year on year, it does require um, supervisors uh, and both at the district and divisional level but also at the centre to play an active role in continuing to weed their way through this process and ensuring uh, that all of these are properly dealt with. So the system on its own, no matter how good it is, it's only as good as the people who are operating it. So um, yes, it's good that we've had these upgrades. Um, but the upgrades are only as good as the, the effort then that we put into it. So I'd qualify it. That yes, it's in piece, a piece of an information technology. That's important. But it's also important the emphasis that we put in this. And I think we've demonstrated that by creating, um, for the first time, this National Child Diversion Bureau. And that's headed up by a chief superintendent with specific and sole responsibility for this area now. So are you confident that you're fully across all of the 
issues involving youth diversion, whether they be issues being referred for inclusion in the system or not, as, as we stand today? Well, yes, I am confident, yes. And there are no further emerging issues that need to be dealt with in terms well, of there discussion are with the authority? Well, there are ongoing emerging issues which um, uh, we've just very recently reported, and I, I signed a letter yesterday, and those issues are in respect of the introduction of 7.3, and uh, we've introduced, we've observed where that system has, has thrown up unforeseen consequences and the fixes that we've put in place to resolve those. But again, as I say, uh, you need also then to make sure that the people looking at this are fully engaged and are supervising it properly as well. And so it's a combination of the two. Well, in terms of what you've just said, it's clearly something we'll want to get into in more detail in committee or at a future authority meeting. Yes. Uh, just given the, the gravity and the concerns around um, the whole issue and the, the, the vulnerability of both the victims and the offenders in this case, it's certainly something that we don't want to leave in any way um, unaddressed. Uh, can I just ask a, a couple more questions in relation to the, the child offenders? Are there any cases where you feel that because of the failure of the, um, the guards to deal with a, a child offender appropriately, that outcomes have actually been significantly worse for those offenders? Well, um, we have wrestled with this question over months and you know, in effect it's been known as shorthand, as a cause and effect. And um, our honest appraisal of it is that it is incredibly difficult to determine because of, of our failure to act here, then subsequently act A, B or C, therefore then was a direct um, or obvious consequence. We cannot see that. So th there's, there's no case that you can point to where you could say definitively that no. because of the guard of failure, the outcome has actually been much worse for this offender or that offender? No, but, but neither do we want to diminish this because an opportunity to intervene was lost and in losing that intervention, we just don't know what would have happened. But we, you know, because we failed, we can't then say also then that we can see a direct correlation, a direct connection between a failure here and then subsequent actions by this young person, subsequent offending by this young person. And are you aware of any cases where a young person, a young offender, has been failed more than once? Yes, we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Can you? Yeah. So in those cases... What, what, is, is what are the statistics now? I mean, the, the worst case scenario that we have uh, is that uh, we have one child that was failed 37 times. So there are significant figures in between that. That we will make available to you. So there were 37 opportunities for intervention? Well, it, no, those are 37 it. referrals. Those, those relate to 37 yeah. referrals. So you're talking about, um, and these are individual cases. We need to be careful about this because you're talking about where an individual comes in and makes um, uh, multiple admissions in effect taken into account. Um, and so it's not 30 se 37 separate instances. This is these so, are grouped together. So, well, then if I rephrase the question, are, are there examples where a child has had the opportunity to have an intervention in their offending behaviour more than once and the organisation has failed more than once to avail of that opportunity? Yes. That's the straight answer, yes. And do you know how often that might have happened? Yes, I do. And then there are a series of figures with it. Can you give us any idea of how often that might have happened? I can we have um, 60 uh, we have generally speaking I'll go through it in terms of I look at it in terms of the members of Angarda Shikana versus the number of times the referral was dropped Okay. So, uh, which, which one you're okay. reading from? Table 23? Table 23. Well, no, no, uh, um, no that's, not the, that's not the question. The question relates to individuals and how often they were failed, not... 
not the failing of individual guard members. Well, perhaps you could okay. yeah. find the figures and, and come back yeah. to us. Well, back to you in relation to that. Yeah. Okay. Can, yeah. okay. can I ask just a couple of very final questions? Um, are, are there cases that you've identified where there's been failures, where there, there's still time to take action, and are you prioritising those cases so that you don't miss opportunities? Uh, well, um, as I said earlier, we are in consultation with the DPP. There may be opportunities um, to advance prosecutions. I fear that because of delay, process has been, uh, in effect, contaminated, and we'll not be able to do that. But we haven't finalised those discussions. But when th one thinks that the majority of these were before 2015, and they were of a certain age then, certainly some of the prosecution is finished, and the indictable prosecutions may be contaminated by the delay. Um, Chair, can I ask one final sure. question, if you can indulge me? Um, and forgive me, this is a slightly technical question, but it has come up in one of your annual reports, and maybe AC Leahy could address this. There does appear to be some sort of an anomaly um, regarding a bar on disclosure of children's convictions, and yet you can talk about their inclusion in the youth diversion scheme. Uh, it's referred to specifically, I think, in your 2017 report. Does that not act as a disincentive to young people to participate in the scheme? You'll have to explain it a little bit more to me, Judith. I'm not familiar with the... What well, it, it, it's, it's in your own annual report, uh, I think it's, it's the 2017 <coughs> report, where it says there appears to be an anomaly regarding a bar on disclosure of children's convictions, but disclosure of inclusion in the youth diversion programme is permissible, and that could act as a disincentive to a young in person. In certain circumstances. Yeah. Maybe it's something you yeah, can it's come something back we can, well, I can give you some more information <laughs> on, uh, probably not appropriate for here, but there are certain circumstances. That, that we can get into. But look, I, I can finish off that previous welcome. question for yes, you now. Yes, please. Just in relation to it, uh, just over 2,500 children had between one and two youth referrals not progressed. Sorry, can just over 2,500 had between one and two not progressed. Yeah. About 870 had between three and 10 not progressed. 35 had between 11 and 20 not progressed. And seven had 20 plus not progressed. Have you any thing that you any comment you want to make on, on those figures, Commissioner? Well, I think that highlights why we're taking this so seriously, um, and uh, we do take this seriously, and we've expended a lot of effort um, in the examination of this. But this is an interim report, and in some ways, we've only got to the halfway mark in terms of dealing with this issue. There, there's, you know, there's more for us to deal with in terms of our organisational processes our organi and our organisational accountability here. Before moving on, Noel should be next. I know Bob wants to come in with a question. Bob. There. Um, Commissioner, just echoing what you have said and what the Chair and other colleagues have said, the importance of this entire work and the significant good that it does, which itself is the reason why the authority has been devoting the level of attention that it has. Certainly in the three years of the authority's existence, I think, I think and I think we all think, this is the most serious issue that has arisen. This is the issue, issue where the level of gravity is at its highest. Uh, notwithstanding the significance of some of the other issues that, that you and we have had to deal with, because of the implications for individuals, because of the consequences uh, for known individuals uh, that has been touched upon. And I think it's really important that we say that clearly. Uh, I know you understand that. I know you appreciate that. But just simply so that those with an interest in this issue and the public generally recognize the extent to which we evaluate the seriousness of it. And that in turn influences or affects the uh, approach we take uh, and the sense we have of some of <coughs> what is being reported and some of what has happened. And to pick up on a point that Moling made in relation to the monitoring uh, report, 
This is a statutory committee. And in its 2017 report, which was written in last year, 2018, when the intensity of this work was fully appreciated, there is a degree of reticence, it seems to me, that borders on the self-denial of a monastic vow of silence uh, because of the implications for what was known for this really important uh, Scheme. And it is difficult to understand how six lines, which doesn't make a reference to the inspectorate's initial views on this, can be deemed to be sufficient. It's only if you know what we know now that one can see what it is to which reference was being made. But anybody reading this who doesn't know what we know now would have had no idea whatsoever. Um, In terms of the importance of the work that you do and the, work, the importance of this particular youth diversion scheme or program, it is important to say, of course, that in 96% of the cases there was no problem. It worked well. But I think the 4% is not the measure. The real measure is the extent to which those that weren't accepted into the youth diversion program have not been dealt with, and that's 47%. 47% of the cases where there's no prosecution were in your own statement as a result of Garda inaction. That's the percentage I think that's relevant in this case, not the 4%. I was struck, and it, perhaps you might be able to uh, offer of a review, as to whether 29% of that material group where there was no prosecution because of the assessment of insufficient evidence. Is, that seems very high to me. Is it high in terms of the normal? Uh, and I'm not sure whether the assessment was by the Garda Shikana or by the DPP or a combination of both. Uh, is, that a right, is that a normal percentage of? Well, um, no, I, I, that, it does look high. Um, I think there is a characteristic of this scheme, which certainly you would have seen um, in the early part of this decade, where it was also there for people who seemed to be on the verge of crime, antisocial behaviour, and it was a means of diverting them from actual crime even before it happened. So there wasn't prima facie cases being put in. It, it was alerting, and, and this is the manner in which the scheme was used. Um, Hiller too, it was used as a means of finding diversion for young people who were on the verge of falling into bad company, into crime, into antisocial behaviour. And certainly what I'm told is very much in our rural, rural communities, it was used extensively throughout the, its existence right up into the 90s and the early 2000s for that process to just divert people away before they fell into crime at all. And, and there may be then, what we're seeing then is the outturn of that, um, that that was the culture around this program. And there was, people were not putting in, in effect, uh, what, is now, what is now required, which is a prima facie case, which will stand up to um, examination. And I, I'm not sure that that's a public good. I think there is a band of people, a band of young people that we become aware of. And before, and why do we have to require that they commit a crime? Before, we, uh, avail, before they can avail of a youth diversion program. So there is a wider debate in, in, in our wish to be, to run and affect this cast iron system as it is. We've created hurdles which didn't exist previously, but, but in terms of this program, we're very successful in effect of, of nipping the problem right at its root at, at, at the very early stages. So an interpretation I have of that 4,500 is there are a group that, that Gardaí were reporting because they thought it would be a good thing if they could get into the youth diversion programme. Yeah, well, you, you've, you've, I think you've, you've answered my next question because it seems to me that they are precisely the kinds of candidates that one would have thought would have benefited. But yeah. having, having been rejected, then there was insufficient evidence. Okay, I, I see the sense in that. Yeah. 
Um, the issue, the point has been made, and I understand the point, that many of these young people were, at the, at the time that they were excluded from consideration for this programme, but in respect of which no further action was taken, had been repeat offenders and went on to be subsequent offenders. <coughs> I just make the point, lest any, any inappropriate inference be drawn from that, because they had been previous offenders, that they didn't merit the consideration that others might have got. It seems to me that they are precisely the people um, where intervention of what are informed would have been appropriate because of the vulnerability that was reflected by the fact that as children they had already been in repeated trouble with the law. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I make the point simply so that there is no misunderstanding of your, your the Garda Sheikhana's position in relation to it. Uh, and lest any, as I said, inappropriate inferences be drawn from it. The final point emerging from, um, again, a point that Moling made when he spoke about the, the fact that the 3,400, whatever the number is, of Garda members, which represents about 25% of the serving Garda members at the moment. But there were more guards involved, as, if I read it properly, because these are currently serving Garda members. Yes. And that the number of Garda, of Garda members of whatever rank, we don't know, who were involved would be higher because some of them would have well, left the organisation. There's, there's been cessations and yes, people finished. whatever. Yes. Which indicates that the scale is probably <coughs> greater in terms of the numbers. And I make no comment or no inference or implication of any kind to any disciplinary process. That's not the point. It's just, it's the scale. Because the final thing I want to say is that there are echoes in this of other patterns that have emerged, even in the last three years of our engagement, of issues where information became known to the Garda Shikana, but was slow in being acted upon, Templemore, where there were serious issues uh, which appeared to be systemic. To, quote, to repeat the word that was used earlier. If it's 25% plus, well then it's everywhere. If it was 1.2 million overstated um, breath tests, it's everywhere. Not equally everywhere, but it's across the board. And a long process of coming to terms with this through the internal review, the 14 to 17 in this case, and so on in other cases. As I say, echoes of past behaviour which one would have thought in the last number of years might have been overcome or might have shown greater signs of having been overcome within the organisation, which is itself a source of worry. Well, um, in response, this is a period in time, 2010 to 2015, and uh, there's a lot of very unfortunate, regrettable headlines are generated by the organisation in, in, in that period. And what I want to do is to make sure that we put our eye back on the ball and, the, and what's at play here is how well we protect the society, how well we serve the society in terms of <coughs> expectations of us. Uh, and I and the team that are with me are determined to do that, that we should do our duty in terms of the public expectation when they report crime that is properly dealt with, and if um, uh, sus suspected offenders are identified, that they're brought to justice uh, appropriately, as they would expect. And indeed, then, that those individuals, particularly um, children, then and also then have the suitable interventions put in place to support them. We're absolutely determined in that. But secondly, even beyond that, uh, we are now in a position of one organisational accountability but also then individual accountability in respect of what happens. All of us in the organisation must ex accept that the part that they have to play in terms of building confidence and providing a policing service to the society as we are charged to do and as is our duty as well. And I would reiterate and indeed state that this is an important moment for the organisation 
that we have to um, accept the public accountability and scrutiny that has brought to bear on this. We can't be, we can't equivocate in accepting our responsibility um, um, in respect of this, and that we are very clear about how we're going to go forward and fix this and accept both organisational and indeed the individual accountability and consequences then that flow from uh, flow from really these failures to provide a proper service to the society. Um, we find ourselves, and I find myself in this um, extraordinary position in terms of being a police officer and what we set out to do in this society, and we have failed and failed by a very considerable margin in a large number of cases. And it's just entirely unacceptable to me. It's entirely unacceptable, actually, to all the senior leadership team that I've talked to about this, and we want to make sure that this doesn't happen again, primarily because it's unacceptable to the public and to and, and what we set out to do and why we joined this organisation in the first place. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks, Bob. Thank no. Uh, thank you, Chair. Commissioner, I want to start by welcoming uh, the haste and urgency with which you have de dealt with this issue since your appointment a short few months ago. I think that's uh, to be noted. And I'm particularly pleased at the public apology you've made today on behalf of Angarth Shiakona's failings and the the, the swift nature at which that apology has been made up front. And I think that's to be welcomed, that apology to victims of crime, to young people and to young people's families. This is indeed a, sit a situation of utmost gravity, um, and there are huge and significant consequences for the victims of crime, for local communities, for young people themselves, both as offenders and as vulnerable young people, and for their families. And we're not just talking about the offences in which Angada Shiakona has failed those young people. We're talking about subsequent uh, mirror offences and downstream subsequent offences and the impact that has had on a further, a further uh, number of victims. And there are also serious implications for policing as a profession in Ireland. And there are, as you've alluded to there, significant additional reputational damage to Angada Shiakona as an organisation that needs to be addressed and that you're setting about. The policing authority is three years old and we've been engaged in independent and, most importantly, external oversight and accountability of your organisation. In those short three years, we've looked at a range of issues, such as the penalty points issues, the breath test issues, the homicide issues, the, the, some child sexual abuse issues, the handling of crime statistics and CSO data, wrongful prosecutions, public order incidents, the issues in Angarda College, and now we're here today talking about youth diversion. We observe a pattern of issues in the organisation's response to, to, to situations such as these. And I would say they're typified up until now by a lack of urgency. And if we think that um, the, the Guard Inspectorate highlighted this issue that we're talking about today back in 2014, five years later, we're addressing it. There is a significant issue about lack of urgency in tackling issues across the organisation. I think, looking back over the range of issues I've alluded to there, there's a lack of, there's a lack of organisational curiosity um, to understand what went wrong. And each issue seems to get treated uh, one, one after the other, a standalone instance. I think a lot of the responses we see are typified by immediately and consistently running first to explanations such as IT, uh, information technology, and if we have another amendment to Pulse, it'll all be okay. Um, Guard the numbers, numbers of supervisors. Um, sometimes these are used as the reason and also the solution. And I suppose, as Commissioner, what are you going to do to change this pattern of organisational behaviour, organisational response and culture? Well, um, and Gardish Kona deals with a wide continuum of demand uh, and policing is a, is a risk business as well. Uh, we, need to, we need to look to our own internal governance, uh, what our internal audit in particular, what our risk management processes are and how well they are operating for us. Because a risk management approach to the introduction of this change in August or in July 2010 may have flagged up, do you know what, we may not know what happens to those cases which don't actually uh, go to a juvenile liaison officer. So that act of risk management um, in respect of, of what we do, not just the inherent uh, risk that we carry because 
We use coercive force and we deal with, in effect, life and death and dangerous situations, but also then in terms of, of what we do as an organisation when we change something. It's a complex business and through risk management, internal audit and our own governance, that's the way in which we manage those risks. But in part then, it's also then the accountability arrangements and be open to the organisational accountability, but also then a culture within the organisation of individual accountability. Uh, and that's where we are at this moment in time. There is both an organisational accountability, and we hold ourselves to account at this venue, but also then um, following on from that, an individual accountability. And that's very important as well. All of us um, have a role to play. All of us um, are in an office, an office of Gardaí. I, I took the same oath as every other um, um, member and officer within the organisation and all of us bear a heavy responsibility when we do that, and with that come responsibilities and accountability. So that's what I want to engender uh, within the organisation, and um, what I find is that a lot of this work was well underway, and we, as a leadership team, wish to develop it over the coming months. Thank you, Commissioner. If I look back over that list of issues I've alluded to there, and I look back over recent tribunals, and, and indeed more, more some further back, going back as far as Donegal, and I look at some of the commissions of inquiry that have taken place, a consistent theme that emerges is that of supervision, first and second line supervision. Um, you know, specifically a lack of meaning in supervision, but also an apparent lack of any real expectation that both work and performance should be supervised. Um, and maybe a casual attitude to performance and a casual at attitude to provision of information at senior level back to the Commissioner. Do you believe, as Commissioner, having been in post now for a number of months, that officers, Gardaí and civilian staff in your organisation really do expect to be held to account for their performance? And how is performance managed right down to individual Garda level? Well, if I pass over just to John, because John has spent tremendous amount of time and effort over many months, both on the path and also then the PALF program. So if I, I let John explain those. Uh, I think Noel, just maybe to, to, to just um, go back a little bit to, to November 2015, which was a number of years ago when the, the issue of accountability and the issue in relation to crime issues had, had been raised and a change had been made at that stage. So we're going back to, to November of 2015 when we began the process of, 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 a, of creating and enhancing and developing and improving the governance around it. So notwithstanding this piece of work and what this was going on, separate to this and in parallel to this, that, that work had commenced. Equally in parallel, the performance accountability and learning framework uh, had, had commenced. And during the course of 2018, uh, uh, all members of Angara Siakana have commenced training on that, and indeed at this, at, at this table and this, this level, and during 2019, that will all roll out and the performance piece will be set and performance measures and targets for every member of the organisation will, will be introduced. So uh, there was a lot of things happening in parallel, and the performance management piece and the training of that took place during 2018, and it's rolling out now as we speak. So, so John, can I take it that by the end of 2019, every member of, sworn member of Ngarda Siakona of whatever rank will have at the start of the year a target setting and will have routine and regular uh, overview of their performance and feedback on same. Yes, yes that's it. Yeah. As, 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 as we're sitting here now, during the course of last year, people underwent the training. And as we sit here now, the 2019 development plans are all being prepared. And over the course of the year, there will be uh, regular meetings with the supervisor to monitor the programme and learn from that and see how we can and will that tie into suitability for promotion and uh, selection for other things if performance is not satisfactory? Well, it, it all feeds in, it all fits in together. Now, there will be various iterations of it. It, it is a new programme uh, that, that, has, that has been introduced, which is specifically targeting at the performance and developing a performance-related culture within the organisation. Okay. And maybe it's probably more a question for Joe. When I look now then, Joe, at the civilian staff, the civil servants who are employed in Agatha Shiakona, can I take it that every one of them are already subject to PMDS and are complying in full? No, the answer to that. And, and why not? Um, the preference of the senior management team is that there would be a unitary uh, performance management system for the organisation. 
and um, that is not the same system that's used across the civil service. And we've been in discussions with civil service unions around that. I'm hoping those, those discussions will come to conclusion very shortly. And as I said, our desire would be that the same system would be used, particularly given the nature of the cross-reporting of GAWDA members and GAWDA staff in the organisation, that a single system would be used. But we'll, we will come back and update the, the authority in respect of those discussions at, probably at our meeting next week. Okay. And, um, Commissioner, Justice Charlton, in his recent report um, in the Disclosures Tribunal, he actually commented that the Garda Shikona organisation has no capacity for self-critique. In all of that we've heard today and in all of the recent issues, uh, we keep being told of fixes that are specific to particular problems. It, it, but I suppose the question is, is the organisation learning? Well, in respect of this issue, um, yes, we have learned. But the important thing is then what difference that makes elsewhere. Because there are other prosecutions, there are other complaints made to the organisation. How well are we doing there? How well are we doing in respect of other investigations? And so that's the next place this, this takes us to. How, how well have we done around the obtaining evidence and, <coughs> and the reporting of adults uh, for prosecution? So having finished this piece of work, it's going to have to open up another piece of work. How, well we, how, how good are our prosecutions? But we are fortunate in that we're uh, introducing um, a management system specifically for our investigations and we'll have a far better oversight of what's going on in respect of the investigations. I think what has inhibited a lot of this is that a lot of our processes have still been pen and ink, paper based, and it's difficult then to extract the management information <coughs> which would provide you the feedback you require. That is changing. There's significant progress in that respect in um, 2019. But even going back to the earlier point about the C, um, CSO and our meeting with the CSO, this is obviously, in terms of our data quality, uh, a black mark against the organisation. We have to resolve this. Uh, and before we can expect to receive a, C a CSO kite mark in respect of our, um, uh, our figures again, our official figures. Well, Commissioner, as I said at the beginning, I do welcome your approach to this. It's refreshing and I do welcome the, the way your senior management team are working with you in this. Um, it is a significant endeavour and there are tremendous reputational issues at play. It feels like it's an unending cycle and that as, you know, everything that's looked at, we keep getting these issues. So I, I, I do hope that you have, have success with your management team in dealing with that. My last question is really more granular. In terms of the young people we've been talking about in the review, are you in a position to say how many young people who were not treated properly by Angada Shiakona have subsequently died in the inter intervening period? Um, there's a total of 57 um, of these individuals uh, are now deceased. Uh, 44 of them uh, died um, as adults. Um, and um, that is very much regretted um, and we are doing further analysis in respect of that group in comparison then um, to the larger group, so the 33,000 referrals um, and so we see what, what particular lessons can be learned. But I think it's a symptom of um, individuals with chaotic lives, mental health issues um, and also then uh, substance be it drug or alcohol abuse issues and if you bear in mind that a young person child 15 16 17 2010 2011 now would now be well into adulthood and the dire consequences and dire impact of prolonged um, uh, exposure to, to to drugs so uh, that's very much very much regretted but it is a very sad fact of these statistics okay. and just just finally looking back over some of the issues and indeed, in this case, we often see a pattern of senior officers, and I'm talking here about chief superintendents, superintendents, uh, maybe not, not always responding to requests for information from your office and from your senior management team, or indeed doing so in a tardy way or an incomplete way. Mm -hmm. um, what are you going to do to change that behaviour? Oh, well, it's entirely unacceptable. It's an unacceptable behaviour, and I think at the very first um, meeting that I was at in public, I was asked about that, and I have said very clearly to the organisation that I expect exemplary behaviours from the senior managers within the organisation and that includes exemplary responses to requests and uh, prompt responses for information and anything else is entirely uh, unacceptable. Commissioner, thank you for your frankness and for the way you're dealing with this. Chair. Thanks, Noel. Could, may, may, I, sorry, may I make just one point? Of um, course, please. 
but it's just a, there's a comment there about a sort of unending cycle of, of bad news. At the same time, I would like to balance that with there's an unending cycle of good news. But last year was a particularly successful year around um, serious organised crime and gangland violence, convictions and investigations that have brought to fruition in terms of the seizure of money, drugs and bringing offenders to justice. And I looked also then to our success in terms of roads, roads policing as well. So uh, and that's not to diminish anything we're talking about at all. At the same time, the organisation does an awful lot of good work, which is public, which is to the public good. And as I go around the organisation, I find people who are very committed to what they're, uh, what they're engaged in and they're well respected and have the confidence of the local community. And I just want to create an organisation that all of us can be proud of and they can be proud of working in as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Simply say, in, not, not in response to that, but as part of that, I've been at every one of the public meetings and there has been none at which there hasn't been key reference to the quality of the work that the organisation does. I, I don't mean that as a repost, yes. but simply there is a, a complete, full, generous, constant appreciation, not only of the quality of the work that the organisation does, but of the difficult circumstances in which Garda members, Garda staff work and the risk the risks that they take and the dangers that they encounter yeah. on citizens' behalf. So that point is fully made, is fully understood and fully accepted. And as I say, at every meeting has been articulated, in private and in public. And it is a source of regret, but that's where we find ourselves, that yeah. the luster of that can sometimes be obscured by the reality of some of the other issues that confront us. Very much so. Thanks, for I was just going to pass on to Pat, but I want to go back very quickly on the, to a technical question in relation to the performance management and the, the two answers, because I'm confused. Um, Commissioner, you spoke about personal performance management and personal accountability. Assistant Deputy Commissioner Toomey spoke about development plans. Now, at the end of a typical performance management process, public or private sector, there is an assessment of performance. The PMDS, which you're not rolling out, contains that for civil servants. There's an assessment of performance. However, at the end of this cycle of 2019, which I think was Noel's question, will there be an assessment of individual performance? Not development, performance. I just didn't get that from your answer. At the end of 2019, how you performed against the target set out in your plan as part of the process. So there'll be a, yes. there'll be a number or a ranking or a satisfactory or unsatisfactory assessment, uh, assessment is conclusion. How you the yes. okay. And Joe, you talked about having a single scheme for all, uh, all those who work in the Garda Chikonis, which uh, I think makes sense. Will it have the same characteristics as the civil service scheme that applies to other civil servants? Will it be equally rigorous? It will be equally rigorous. It, it, I think the issue has been almost the last point you made, the difference between the scale, whether we have a scale, a number, a yes, no. Okay. You know, I think that's what we're talking about. Because your, about. your civil service staff have been at a disadvantage because uh, to enter certain promotion competitions, you need your PMDS rating to carry with you, and they've been going with a blank page. No, they haven't been going with a blank page where people have been entering into competitions our performance valuation has been has been completed. So you did a special one? A special one. But, okay. but the formality of having the system which it has been absent. And I think, in fairness, God staff have suffered as a result of yes, that I internally. Think they have. I think mm -hmm. So having that system, which is very clear, that outlines what is expected of people up front and how they're performing against that and what additional development needs there are around that, it has been, hasn't been helpful. So, as I said, we're very keen on this side of the table that the civil service unions would see the benefits of the system that we have within and mm -hmm. We can make some modifications to that so that some of the outputs that are needed for civil service competitions so that we can have comparison, you know, proper comparisons are done. That I think we can achieve. Okay. And I certainly would encourage that the civil service unions are listening in this that they would move to accept the, the PAF system that we have in place. Thank you. Pat. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Commissioner. 
just want to maybe discuss for a few moments the Code of Ethics and Culture, Culture Reform, in relation to the Youth Diversion Programme and the issues that have thrown up. And we all know the importance of the Code of Ethics, speaking up, duty to uphold the law, leadership, promoting confidence in policing, supporting victims. And we know from the Culture Audit that was carried out last May that while there were some positives, and that is an opportunity to mention some of the positives, like the local commitment, commitment to the local community, there were many challenges. And overall, it found the audit, and these are your own people saying this, that the culture was not fit for purpose. There were lots of unwritten rules and some insights, like don't challenge, lack of accountability, keep your head down, silence means survival. Now, the view of the authority is that the Code of Ethics and culture reform is increasingly important with each failure that arises. That's the view of the authority. But my question to you is, what role do you see for the Code of Ethics and culture reform in ensuring that the issue we're discussing today will not reoccur in the future? Well, I think that um, at every opportunity I have emphasised the Code of Ethics, at every opportunity I have spoken to the organisation, I put an emphasis on the Code of Ethics as being uh, the foundation of the behaviours that I expect within the um, organisation, um, uh, without any equivocation at all. And I repeat uh, that at all times um, that I have the opportunity. Um, in looking at this, and you look at um, uh, the behaviours behind it and, and those behaviours then portray the culture, one cannot be pleased nor proud of what they see and indeed um, uh, in some ways, in lots of ways, this is uh, professionally uh, embarrassing uh, that this should happen and particularly this should happen in such a scale and indeed I'll go further and say it's professionally humiliating for us as an organisation but we need to accept that, learn from it and then change our behaviours accordingly. Behaviours, culture follows the behaviours and uh, I am absolutely insistent on the behaviours that I expect throughout the organisation from all individuals, whatever their rank or position, that those behaviours should truly then um, be those that are set out in the uh, Code of Ethics. And this was from a period 2010 uh, to 2015. The Code of Ethics is important but also then the uh, the actual outworking of how we respond to this and how we respond to this in terms of the Code of Ethics is also very important as well. And again, that's something that I would intend to emphasise um, internally as I go forward. So um, there's no, no resistance, at, um, I would say, at this side of the table or amongst any of my senior leadership team in respect to the Code of Ethics. We've all recently re-signed a public document for display throughout the organisation and throughout the estate. So um, we are entirely committed, but we're also then, in, in line with the Code of Ethics, we're entirely committed to the accountability that's needed in respect of this and, put, and putting it right, but making sure that other areas in turn, we learn from this and they're put right as well. Again, in line with the service that we should, that we should be providing to the public. And as I've said earlier, I think this is a very important moment for the organisation. We don't want to, we've had these opportunities before, and we just we need to make sure that we actually lift one and seize it properly and move forward with it. Thank you, Commissioner, and I do appreciate the comments you've made since taking up office in relation to the Code of Ethics and the The reason I asked the question is it was silent, your report, your interim report, and comments made up to now, you were silent on uh, Code of Ethics and Cultural Reform. So I did want to give you that opportunity. Ethics and culture reform in further reports. I think it is central. It is central to achieving success and mm -hmm. these issues arising in the future. So I'll leave that thought with you. Uh, I think the biggest challenge for any leader is changing culture. And uh, I'm just wondering, and I know you want to do that, um, but where are you in, I presume you're working on a plan, an overall integration plan to change culture. I'm just wondering, have you developed a plan yet? To, uh, for cultural reform, is that, where is that on your agenda? Um, if, if you were to ask me, and, you know, for my plan, uh, you know, there's my strategy for cultural reform. I have to say, 
what I would say to you is my strategy is respect to behaviours. Then the behaviours that I can that I can see, that my supervisors can see, and then are defined there. Um, and if we start, uh, you know, I genuinely think, Pat, it, and you know, I have experience of this, when you start with behaviours, you set out the clear expectations, and you measure people against them, then culture follows on um, behind that. Culture is very slow to change, and so I can't wait for cultural change before I see the behaviours that I want to see. I have to concentrate on something which I think is tangible, and that's my view of this, and I know that I could get into you know, quite a debate about this, but my, my view of this is that I want to run an org, you know, taking into account the results from the internal audit, for instance, that we have a clearly an organisation which is a meritocracy, um, where it doesn't matter, you know, who you, who you know, it's what you know and your ability to do the job, and, but secondly, it's an organisation where you can speak out and you'll be supported, but that all individuals in the organisation are treated in a fair and equitable manner, and all of us are equally subject to the rules and regulations of accountability. And that's the organisation I want to create, and the behaviours then that flow from that. And I feel, personally, I'm well on the way in respect of that. Every day, um, I make decisions, and those decisions demonstrate those values in terms of how I treat the personnel, and some of the conundrums as well that I face it as well. No, I understand that, and I can see your personal actions that it is driving behaviour. Uh, but if you look at the recommendations coming out of the culture audit, it would have a whole series of recommendations yes. from your people talking to the people who report them and explaining the importance of culture and how we're going to go forward. And I think most organisations would find it helpful, you know, that the culture you want would be articulated and a plan to achieve that. I'm not disputing that. Well, sorry, well, yourself, I, yeah. well, I should clarify in terms of the culture audit, there is a planned. Um, in respect to, that the senior leadership team uh, is going to see over the next few weeks in terms of the next steps in addressing the issues uh, reflected in the cultural audit. And those are around uh, um, you know, things like promotion, uh, people's trust in that, uh, but also um, the feedback that we've received when we've done further focus groups out in the districts and divisions of what the next steps are to take and the, answers, and the pillars of of um, the organisational integrity, that there is no gap between you know, what I say or what we say collectively and then how we act. Yeah. I think the quicker you do that, the better. The yeah. audit report came out last May, so before you know where you are, it's going to be a year gone, and we'll be talking about doing another audit and measuring the progress made. So I know there's not on your, a lot on your table, a lot on your plate, but I think it's really, really important to give that, to give that urgency. Uh, do you still, by the way, one of the first questions I asked you, and you give a very fine answer, which was positive, uh, do you think you can achieve cultural change in your five-year term? And I said to you, you said yes, and I said, that's going to be a wonderful legacy. And I'm just wondering, five, was it five months into the job, do you still share, <laughs> do you still hold that view? I hope you do. You hold the ambition anyway, I'm sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. This, you know, um, having a job like this is a privilege. You know, it's a privilege in terms of the difference you can make to society. And I think actually that's what we need to focus on in the first place. Um, actually the difference, the public good that we can do as an organisation. We're here principally as an extension of good citizenship and in protecting the society from harm. So the culture that I want is a culture which emphasises that an outward facing organisation, not just in to our society and our nation here, but also internationally, the, the, the reputation that we enjoy and the difference that we make, so that we take our place along with, with others in terms of making a difference, not only here, but worldwide. And there's lots that we have to offer. And there's certainly lots we can do over the next period of time. And I have the privilege of leading very, very, fine, very, very many fine people. Uh, and I know that within the organisation, there is the capabilities and the qualities needed to do that and achieve it. One of the things that uh, the Court of Ethics Committee discussed with uh, Assistant Commissioner Pat Leahy was the Garda decision-making model. And we found, and I think we influenced uh, your thinking, that the Code of Ethics needs to be at the, at the centre of the Garda decision-making model. And we were pleased to see that being taken on board. I just haven't seen it yet um, being rolled out, being published and rolled out, because uh, you know, most of your members have a lot of autonomy. You know, they have to make decisions on their own. So it's really, really important that that model is there with the Code of Ethics right at the centre to influence and guide their behaviour. So, so my question is, where are we on the, on the Garda decision-making model? Well, I, I have seen one, but 
But maybe they prepared a special one for me. So I'll ask, <laughs> ask well, if it, they did, it's the same special one they prepared for us. We have a special one rolled out. Out. No, no, no. The, the Stitcher Making model is complete. And I think there's some um, activity between the CEO and the college at the moment in relation to this, Joe, if I'm not mistaken. But it's in yeah, training plan for 2019 will include that as one of the elements along with the mapping. Yeah, I, th I think it's really, really important. I have two final questions. Um, you said one of your biggest challenges was communication when I asked you before, and I agree with you in relation to cultural reform and changing behaviour and everything. I'm just wondering how you got on with your members. I'm talking about the members who didn't sign yet the Code of Ethics to say that they would abide by it. Uh, yeah, I suppose they're happy to say they got the training, um, but certainly the part which is fine, we want that. But the important part of it is that their certification that they will abide by the Code of Ethics. Your plan was rather than tell them to sign, would be to write to them, communicate to them individually, and persuade them. I just wonder, did that happen yet, and what the response is? Um, I said, for the, the first place we were was with the staff associations, and so that engagement has commenced. I've met, met both um, with GRA and AGSI in respect of this, and I would like a position where they have at least moved their position, and then I'll write individually then, and I think we're making progress um, because I, I, it's just been a question of sitting down and having a long conversation with them about um, what this code of ethics means. And I think what's very important for us is that um, in, <coughs> in a world where there is such fear about you know, the rise of extremism, the erosion of the rule of law, that it is very clear that we as an organisation are entirely wedded to the rule of law and fulfilling our obligation to society. And I think in part, in large part, that's what the Code of Ethics is about. That we have a Code of Ethics which makes it very clear what our function is and what we abide to. So um, it's way beyond the debates of is this part of the discipline code or not. It actually goes to the root of what we are as an organisation. And so it's through those conversations that I hope to persuade and move forward as well. But at the same time, there is an expectation if you seek promotion that you'll sign up to the code, yep. uh, you'll sign up to the code of ex uh, 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 code of ethics. And we appreciate that. And we're talking about you know you're doing good things, and it's not good if we're here here talking in six months' time about a high percentage, relatively high percentage of your members who have not signed their commitment to abide by the code of ethics. So we hope it, we get it off the agenda and that everybody yeah. gets trained and signed up. Just my last question. I uh, really do appreciate the fact that you're leading the messages for the videos, the recordings promoting yes. the Code of Ethics internally and externally. Yes. And I think that's happening next week, as I understand Yes, it. that's correct, yes. And uh, doesn't you want to give us a flavour of your key message you'll be saying internally or externally? Well, I think the, the key message is the one I've just given, that the Code of Ethics is actually absolutely integral to a policing function that Angarda Shikana is responsible to. And we have to recognise, and I, as I recognise, and I want everybody in the organisation to recognise, we have a unique position within the society. Fundamentally, we're here to protect people, but we're also here to uphold the rule of law, as, as um, expected you know, in a modern democratic state, which is uh, a constitution well respected, that we, that we do all that we can to protect that constitution and state. Just finally, I'll just ask you, no need to answer, to consider including in the Youth Diversion Programme for the reports, your next report, as the reports develop, that yes. you would include role of the Code of Ethics and Cultural Reform. Okay. The issue, I think, to be useful to do that for us. Okay, thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. I have some tidy up questions. If my colleagues have any further questions? Okay. Um, in, in, in one of your responses, Commissioner, I, and I can't remember with which of my colleagues, you referenced the fact that, of course, the same behaviour can arise in relation to adult cases, adult lapsed cases. Yeah. And this is something that the inspectorate also addressed in 2014 and recommended that there should be an audit. Um, did that ever happen? To John? Uh, a specific yeah. audit in, in relation to... Uh, Adult cases that yeah. had lapsed yes. it, 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 through it, passage of time. Because as I understood the commissioner's comment earlier, then you would expect the same range of behaviours to exist in adult cases, guard inaction, insufficient evidence, and so on. So th that's so, uh, why I'm asking. Yeah. There has been no audit in relation to the, 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 the 
There's no similar audit to the one we're talking about here okay. today. But what there has been, which I think is important, there's been a number of iterations to ensure the tracking of crime, and that's the one we came in from 2015. So it, it, in, in, in our next work plan, um, I, I'm sure that's something that should be considered. But I suppose I think it's important to say that from 20, November of 2015, the ability for district officers to track the crime and, and the stage and the status of that investigation is there and that cascade is through all our management reports sure. and is dealt with through the PATH process. And I'm very aware that the investigation management system this yes. year will significantly yes. enhance your capacity yes. to do this. Will you connect performance deficiencies that you find in the investigation management system with your performance management system? We expect considerable developments in the next iteration of our PALF system. And in a performance management system, when it comes in, invariably the first iteration and the second or third iteration, uh, there's considerable developments and enhancements in how the whole system between promotion, between all of the various different workings of the organisation, uh, and they were, we expect that they'll be in the next iteration. So and have you a rough timeline for that? I don't mean a month, I mean, is it next year? Well, this year? I mean, this year we're focusing on the implementation of it. And I think at that stage then, from 2020 on, we will I be guess looking at the well, next iteration. The reason so. I'm connecting these items, uh, John, is as the, the Commissioner pointed out, and I can't do better than his words, that the organisation has failed on a significant scale. So in a few months' time, when the investigation management system is rolled out, you'll have reports <laughs> that will show you this. Yes. And, and I'm trying to make the connection. I think you can see where I'm going with it. Yeah. I do, we don't want to be here this time next year saying we had this lovely report out of the investigation management system, but we didn't connect it with individual accountability. That's, that's the question. Are you, are you designing the, the, the future performance oversight well, well, the to help manage the, the next one of these? Well, the two things are rolling out in tandem, and really this time next year when we've completed that, we'll be in a far better um, position to answer those specific questions, but if we think now how we will get to where we want to be in January 2020, that's a fair enough question, and, and we'll take that away and provide an explanation okay. as to how we will join up we, PATH, the individual performance of PATH, and then We're much like the more IMS. interested in prevention in that context in the yeah, same way sure. as crime prevention is important. Yeah. I think there's a lot of your organisation's time being taken on backward looks, and it would be much better if you we're able to deal with things in the live. Yeah. Uh, and so we wouldn't be, be, be looking backwards always. So that's one question. Um, Moling asked about, uh, in, in, in this cohort of cases, uh, in, in, in the juveniles who were unsuitable, there were a number where DPP directions were not followed. That's correct. 26. Is that likely to be a feature in other aspects where the director says, X, Y, Z is to be prosecuted and simply nothing. Well, well, I think if we provide a more in-depth explanation of that, and it's easy to do because okay. uh, we can just anonymise the cases. Um, some, were, some were dealt with, but not entirely in line with the directions and not, not all the offences were committed. And also then, in other cases, then um, uh, the offenders couldn't be located. Because it's all part of the reassurance loop. Yeah. And yeah, why but, that area is, we, is in, of interest to us. Definitely, we can certainly open up those, those 26 referrals, 10 individuals, and you, then you can see that the, the, there's nuances within that. There always will be people who are evading justice, and, and so it is amongst this, this juvenile group as well. Of course. Um, one of the responses in your, uh, the material that, that uh, you laid out before us is an e-learning module Yes. It's mandatory? Yes. Am I right in thinking that's the first time you've made an e-learning module mandatory? A national one. It's the first, the first national, national one. First it's national mandatory. One. I'd like to congratulate you on that. Right. Uh, I, I, I think it's... A, and, and we've had a look at the material, and it's very good material. Using e-learning is obviously efficient, but making it mandatory is, is, is very important. And so we'd like to congratulate you on that and, and encourage you to use that approach... Uh, um, in, so, in, in other areas. So that's only commenced, so we can report and take up over the coming months. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, one, two, three, four, just a, a few very brief questions. 
you engage an, an external company to verify your yeah. data. Are they finished their work? Uh, almost finished, um, so, but so far um, our figures are very much chiming with their figures. Uh, yeah, they no, I, and, so, and you briefed us on, uh, yeah. on that yesterday as well, and, and there is very little divergence, and, and congratulations on that. When they're finished, might we have a copy of their report? Yes. yes. In terms of the, your own uh, review, um, you're yeah. referring to interim reports and so on, but really what we've received are you know, well, letters. It, yeah. When do you think we might get a substantial, as you've seen from the questions, there's been additional data that we've managed, you know, that we've asked you about, yeah. and when do you think uh, you might be in a position to supply us with a more detailed, albeit maybe not complete, a more detailed report that we could actually you well, know, analyze in some depth? Well, there's um, an internal report um, in draft form was delivered to me yesterday, so um, the, the, the meat and bones of it exists. Uh, it just needs some further refinement, okay. and then we'll be able to provide that. Well, we'll keep in touch on that. Yes. You also referenced the CSO and um, wanting to get there. I think you said kite mark. Mm -hmm. Just before Christmas, the CSO published their latest crime, review of crime stats, in which they also published an action plan that they have proposed for you. Is that action plan accepted, and is it being implemented? Uh, yes, the action plan has been accepted, and our interim uh, chief data officer uh, has been working out the logistics of how we go about implementing that. We have, in the last couple of days, uh, received a proposal from him that has to be considered by um, the Commissioner and the Executive in okay. the next week or so. But, you, but you've accepted the yes. plan? Yes. yes. just yeah. thought it was an unusual formula that they publicly proposed a plan to you, so I wondered. Okay. Well, well, there is a lot of discussion going on with the, w with the CSO on an ongoing basis, um, and uh, you know, we have taken a lot of steps. I think in the same team, they did acknowledge that there has been some considerable improvements, and they felt that these steps, in addition to what the other work that's going on, would really you know, improve the overall system. So in terms of uh, um, accepting the plan, yes, and we will continue to work with the CSO. Okay. Um, that was really... Oh, yes, there was one final question. I know I asked you this the last day, Commissioner, but um, I thought it important, because it's focus on this today, that I ask it again, um, whether, to your knowledge, there are any integrity issues around the guard, the performance de deficits in this, in this, pro in this case. Uh, integ actual integrity issues. Mm. Um, and again, I, I understand you have to be I, I, careful. It's, so. it's difficult for me to answer that okay. in, in the context of, an, of the direction that I've, that I've asked the Chief Superintendent okay. to take on. Fair enough. Then we'll to be continued, I think, to is be the best continued. way to answer Absolutely. that. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Um, I was very interested in your response to, to Pat about the uh, that your uh, having some thoughts about responding to the elements of the culture audit. So we might, we had a very useful public event when the audit was launched. We might think about a public event of response because I think it would be good okay. uh, for people to see the, the response to some of the elements. Yeah. But we'll talk about that on another day. So with that, um, can I thank uh, my colleagues because this has been a significant issue. Um, I want in particular to thank my colleague Noel Brett because this is his last meeting of the authority um, and uh, he, he, he's, he's leaving us um, but his contribution has been from my point of view uh, immense and uh, if you felt some hard questions then I congratulate him for those, that's what, he, that's what he's here for but we will miss him. Um, I want to thank the team who prepared us because this has been an intensive piece of work for the authority team uh, and I've no doubt it's for yourselves. I want to thank you for the manner in which you approached the discussion today, uh, for your upfront apology. Um, the scheduled meeting of the authority is only a week away, so I'm sure we'll, we'll pick up some of these themes uh, again uh, next week. So we're adjourned until next week and we'll meet again in public at the end of February. Thank you very much.